Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, and tonight we're very happy to be hosting another installment in our series of Exile Books Talks. The special guest tonight is Mr. Gene Moreno. He will be discussing name publications. We're also being joined by Mr. Nicholas Lobo this evening. And here to introduce our guests, please welcome to the microphone the founder of Exile Books, Ms. Amanda Keeley. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you guys all for coming, and I'm really happy that this is our third talk for Exile Books, hosted by Books and Books. Um, it's an honor to be here. I want to thank Books and Books. I want to thank Mitch Kaplan for inviting us, the staff of Books and Books, and everyone that helps with Books and Books, including Lauren, who's here tonight. Uh, so thank you. Um, I also wanted to tell everybody that all of the name publications that we're talking about tonight are up in the front room, so feel free to go up there after and peruse all the material, um, and including that Nick is going to be signing his book tonight, um, so I'm really happy about that. And to just quickly talk a little bit about Gene so we get some background information on him. Um, I actually had an opportunity to meet Gene when I first moved back to Miami about a year ago, and I was told that he was the person to talk to if I was interested in artist books. So I went right, right to the source. Um, what I've learned about Gene is that he wears many hats. Um, he's an artist, he's a writer, he's a curator, and he's also a publisher. Um, Gene is the founder of Name Publications, which is a nonprofit press that was started here in 2009. Um, he is the artistic director of Cannonball, where he first started the research, where he just started Research Art Dialogue, also called RAD Education Platform. His artwork is currently featured um, at PAM at the Permanent Collection Show, and he, was all, he will also be included in the next Havana Biannual. Um, his recent texts have appeared in Eflux Journal and Dis Magazine, as well as the current, current Montreal Biennial Catalog. And in 2013, he edited the Accelerationist, am I saying it right? Okay, <laughs> Aesthetics Issue for Eflux, and organized the Escape Velocity Symposium in New York. Um, and one more thing is, uh, before we get started, is just to tell people to please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and sign up for our newsletter so that you know every all of our calendar events and what's happening at Exile Books, and that our next talk will actually be with another name publications artist, Adler Garrier, on Friday, November 7th. So, Jean, if you'd like to get started, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Amanda, and thank you for Books and Books. And I think I want to introduce Nick before we get going. Um, so Nick is a Miami-based artist with, a, I guess, a, a, a very fast-growing CV. Uh, he's shown at Marlboro Chelsea in New York. He's currently in a show in San Francisco, or a forthcoming show in San mm -hmm. um, If you want to see Nick's work, he's also in the same Pam show of the Permanent Collection. Uh, and in town, he's represented by Gallery Diet. So there's that. And um, I think one thing that's important to mention, because I think it'll become relevant when he starts speaking about his project, is that Nick is really interested in non-visual forms. So audio and music become really important, and the cultures that emerge around certain musical genres uh, become um, raw material for him to work with. Yeah? So, Nick. That's um, and I guess for my part, I think what we kind of talked about a little bit was maybe um, going through the, the genesis of name and how it came about. Uh, and I think the easiest way to th that for me to think about it is, um, my it, part, it stems from a relationship with kind of writing that doesn't want to be writing, right? So it's novels that want to really think of the material nature of the book. So if you think of anything from the life of, of and opinions of Tristan Shandy, Right, so there's the black page in that, and there's the kind of um, this kind of desire to actually make the material nature of the text really important. So I think it begins there in some way, and um, and it goes so then we get into the modernist novels that really want to make you aware that the text is a thing and it's sitting on another thing, and the book is a thing and the world is full of things, um, and no one I think in relation to the book has figured that out better than artists. At least 
um, for a span of the 20th century, it seemed like artists really understood the material nature of books. And if you think from the beginning of the 20th century, well into the 70s, I think artists were the ones who were thinking of what a staple back means, right? Or what a spine means and what you can do with it and how you can tweak it. Um, and I think some, at some point in the maybe 90s, architects um, attempted to take that away. And so you have things like Rem Koolhaas books, um, but architects turn out to be really bad at it. And somewhere I wrote that, <laughs> that, the, that, that the kind of Warhol platinum of small, medium, large, extra large became like the dead corpse gray of all the other doorstop books that followed in the late 90s and 2000s. And so this kind of star architect monograph, which had the potential to become this amazing thing, kind of became this um, repetitive object that kind of um, was, had a really nice graphic. It just was the same graphic over and over and over again. Um, and that coincided with the drainage of actual real content in these books, right? I don't know, architects might disagree, but I think that's a bit fair. Um, so so this, is, this is the background to how name starts. And, um, or this is the background that, right, it doesn't push towards name starting. It's just what's there when the opportunity for name to start. And name just starts when the Knight Foundation announces the first um, grant. And what they asked for was so simple. It was just a paragraph. And so I just wrote a paragraph that I would love to do a press, the way certain European artist books presses were. And that seemed to be enough, for them anyways. And so, um, so they decide, um, I, I, got, I was in the first round of grants for the Knight Foundation, um, which was a really learning experience. It was my MBA, right? I remember walking into a meeting, uh, and they were eager to give me money. And I showed up and they asked me, um, so you know, like, what are you gonna do with this money? So I said, well, I'm gonna make these books. And you know, so they're, well, how much is each book gonna cost? So I said, well, you know, it's ballpark three to four dollars. And they said, how much is it gonna cost a ship? Well, it's gonna be ballpark 500 to whatever. And uh, so at some point, the then Miami project manager just kind of pushed his chair away from the conference table. Um, in a very unart world kind of way. <laughs> and he just said, we're going to have this meeting in a week without any ballpark figures. And so I was like, oh, this is how the real world works, right? <laughs> you have to have real numbers. So I have to go back home and kind of research and pin down what I wanted to do and who I wanted to do it with. And I guess I learned my lesson because it worked out. Um, so that's how the money emerges. And the shape of the books em emerges because once, once I had the money, that, of course, wasn't enough, right? It had to have like a sculptural kind of thing to it. Um, so for a long time, I've been interested in standards and processes that try to standardize materials. Um, thinking of like, right, the recurrent mo module of the eight foot by four foot, right? So like plywood and sheetrock and everything is not everything, but there's these modules. And it seems in construction, for instance, when you st once you start leaving the module, you're increasing your bottom line, right? Or not your bottom line, your cost, right? So if you, if you want to make a room that's eight by four, it has, eight, if it has an eight foot height, it's always going to cost you less than if you want to leave that standard. So I was really interested in the way these kind of things work, right? The, the foot by foot tile, this sort of thing. So I wondered how you translate that into books. And the way that I decided to do that, or that I figured out how to do that, was actually to reach out to Chinese printers and ask them what was the most co cost-effective um, format. So it wasn't the cheapest. It was the one that would give me like the most bang for my dollar. So through different uh, printers, we ended up figuring out that it was the 6 by 9 hardcover, 100 page format that would give me the most. So it wasn't the cheapest, right? If I went soft cover, it would be a little bit cheaper at the end, but you know, it wouldn't have the heft of a artifact you can throw across the room, right? Which has some value, right? Um, so, so it was actually, I let the Chinese printers tell me what my form should be, how they, how, how they had through their processes um, 
render the standard of that field or the kind of most economic method. So this is why the first books all look the same, right? And so the first book, so, so and then the reaction to this from artists has actually been kind of really amazing. So the first artist that I approached to work with was Daniel Newman. And he, I think, did me a little bit one better. So I kind of gave him the template. I said it has to be six by nine, around 100 pages. You have no other restrictions. Um, and so what he decided to do was to make an, 18, an 18th century type history of ideas book. Um, but he decided to do it the way you would do it in the 21st century. So he just downloaded 112 pages from the internet. And uh, his only intervention in that was to alphabetize them and to stick funny images in them. So actually the first book is this white book, right? Um, so if you look through it, it's just 112 pages from the internet alphabetized. Because that's, he, his claim is that that's the only way you do a history of ideas in the 21st century, right? And so, so this is, uh, so this, this, this method kind of keeps going. The second book does, the artist did actually the reverse. She made a handmade book and then just scanned all the pages. But what I really like about it is that she didn't hide the fact they were scanned. So when you look at the book, you see all the edges and all her kind of pristine work it like it, to me it feels like a very old book in in the methods in which it was produced but then it was so so sharply now and just running it through a scanner and not trying to hide that um i don't know that felt to me like very kind of 2012 in some way that that the original book wasn't right the original book still wanted to have a aura of original artwork or something and so all this works out fine until we start working with designers. And uh, so designers didn't really care about this whole conceptual thing that I try to build and trying to work with, let the Chinese decide what the size is and all. They're like, we're designers, we want to do it our way. So the first designer worked okay. And the second one, who is uh, Marti Guiche, who's a, a designer from Barcelona, uh, he was like, no. And it didn't start as no, it just, um, in very designerly fashion, he twisted things until it became his book and his way and his size and his format. So it's the first soft cover book that we make. And uh, it totally threw out the kind of budget. Um, and it threw it out not because it was more, just because it was less in a way. So it just all didn't work out. Um, and so I guess the, the freedom that that allowed was that once you kill the format, all formats were open. And, and so I start working with artists and it's, you know, there's always that template that they can start with or they can go in other directions. And so Adler, who's going to speak here next week, he kind of went a different way. And, uh, and I think the latest thing that's happened with name is that actually this kind of visual, you know, this, this visual heaviness that all the books have um, has gone away with the last two books. And the last two books have actually been very text theory heavy. And one is, uh, one is about kind of, I mean, I don't know, it's about blackness. It has some weird mystical metaphysical thing. So, for, so it's, it's based on a text by a French philosopher called Francois Laruelle, who's kind of this up and coming post, post structuralist kind of guy. And four people responded to a text of his that has four parts. And each one took one. And so there's a, there's a guy who's a, 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 a philosopher of, of um, religion. There's a guy who's a media um, studies guy. There's a guy who's, uh, who comes from the media field but is really interested in Gothic storytelling. And so they each respond to one part of this text on blackness. And in the latest book, the last book, which actually broke the format altogether, right? So it looks like this. Um, it's actually a full theory book, um, and it's actually, this is like Name's bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's also kind of the one that's been gotten to the most universities and that sort of thing. So this is the new kind of pocket-sized theory stuff that we're working on. Um, 
The next one's called The Gray, and it's about architects and designers that are maybe trying to think their field in a different way, and they're trying to do it through kind of these theory fictions. So there's one that there's um, Leopold Lambert, is, for instance, is someone who's thinking New York City as a commune. Um, Francois Rocher did a text about something he calls The Gray, which is, I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it's this weird moment that connects um, environmental green stuff, right, in, in a kind of, in like the fungal nastiness of that with uh, this Delusian other thing. So that's The Gray. He, he, you got to read the text. Uh, and so that's the next book. And so I think this is kind of where, where energy and resources are going for this kind of, to grow this series. Um, yeah, so I didn't say anything about Nick's book, right? Because he can probably say more than I can. I guess Nick was, it's this, this thing, and he was stuck with the format. He was still at the time of the standardized format. It was pretty early. Chinese yeah, <laughs> the Chinese, yeah. Yeah, what it, was, the Chinese it was book number three. Yeah. Book number three. I like the Chinese format, actually. Mm. It's, the, it's the remnants of the Cultural Revolution or something. The printer, I believe his name was Vince. <laughs> I had a lot of communication with him. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, well... I don't know, maybe you want to... Uh, what happens that? when you get a template? That is six by nine, a hundred pages. Uh, yeah, well, and you I have like, to fill it in. I like the container idea, actually. Um, when you presented it to me, that was kind of the main thing that I saw was this idea of like, here's a container, you can fill it with stuff. And um, what I started thinking about uh, was, well, what doesn't normally have a container? And what I ended up with was something that had had a container but just just recently lost it which is the album or the idea of an album right uh, up until recently that was a very physical container and then you know 10 15 years ago it just completely lost it so i wanted to kind of take that idea and then pack it back into something in this case uh you know a book so yeah but i mean i think there's more backstory that and Nick's not disclosing. Yeah, well, <laughs> let's, tell me about it. No, you, you, you tell us about it. Uh, What's the title of the book? Album Graphics. Okay, why? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, the, the, in the end, the concept for the book was kind of like extended, extended, extended liner notes for a variety of albums or an album that uh, was so massive in scope that, you know, the liner notes would be the size of this book. Um, and I ended up uh, working on this uh, sort of like scale of uh, go-go music. I don't know if anybody knows. That's what I wanted to clarify because I had done research on the book to mm -hmm. write the description for our website. And I still couldn't decipher exactly the genre of go-go music. And can you give me a little backstory on that? Okay, yeah. I mean, I'm really far from an expert. I, all I know about go-go music is what I learned through making the book, actually. But um, as I understand it, you know, go-go music starts in Washington, D.C. with kind of a pioneer of funk music named Chuck Brown. And... <clears throat> the name Gogo apparently refers to like a smaller conga drum. So the bands um, that would play this kind of Gogo music didn't have large conga drums, so it wasn't funk anymore. It was Gogo music, and it really—it's uh, about this kind of event. Um, the Gogo is an event, and the bands are like huge, kind of jam band-sized things. There's like 10, 15 people, and. Um, it's, you know, it's this kind of music that is always about to break through into the mainstream, but never like really does. So, and it's still like that, you know, it's this kind of underground scene. And I think part of the reason that that's happened is because it's so much about the event 
you can't sell recordings of it and make that much money for some reason, right? It's about the party. It's about what the band does at the party. So. And it's go go because the congos are smaller, so they can travel easier. Well, they're called uh, go go drums okay. instead of congo drums. Yeah, and so that's you know that's the seventies. So you volunteered to be a graphic designer for them. Yeah, well, so my idea was like to kind of put myself in a place where I didn't belong. Like I have nothing to do with that scene, and I'm definitely not a graphic designer generally. So I kind of wanted to be the wrong guy in the wrong place. Um, and see what would happen. So yeah. <laughs> so but so as far as I understand, GoGo -Go too. It's so it it got lodged between two moments in history, right? So funk ended and disco came in, and they got somehow stuck in the middle, and they became really successful in D.C. to where they would charge I don't know ten thousand dollars a night for a show, and so no one else knew who they were, so they could never leave D.C. Right? They couldn't book a, a club in Philly because they wouldn't pay them their gig fee. And so it got, um, it just became a DC phenomena that can't leave DC ever because it, no one, um, right? It's like the local artist who's really famous in his town mm -hmm. and no one else will pay that market value. Um, so, so I, I mean, to me, that was really interesting, this idea that like success hampers you, right? And were you in Washington or you were in Miami? No, this is all remotely. So like I thought about going to Washington at first, but uh, then I realized that one of the kind of like controversial issues about the go-go scene at this point is that most of like the negotiating and the scene kind of happens online right now. So yes, the parties happen, but there used to be like this whole kind of like uh, street corner uh, cassette sales, like poster kind of scene. And that just all happens online now. So I thought if it's all happening online, it's better to just kind of stay online with it. Engage virtually. Yeah. And it, it really worked out better that way because, um, you know, I think that documenting the project worked better that way because everything was instantly documented. And most of like what the visual identity that was uh, already occurring kind of, takes the place of like, you know, a, a MySpace background or like a Facebook thing or like, you know, you do a t-shirt design and then it turns into like, uh, you know, a flyer or something that gets posted on Facebook and that kind of thing. So it's all like circulating online. It was just a lot easier to work that way instead of just like showing up with, you know, a camera and a laptop or something and trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it feels like now talking about it, the, the the project was quite a bit ago. <laughs> yeah? Does the go go music is it still a scene that's happening, or this is something? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's ongoing. It's like you know, thirty years or more, Great. forty forty years, I guess. It's been ongoing. Actually, Chuck Chuck Brown just uh, recently died. He's considered like the father of go go music. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so the reason I was saying that it seems like a long time is because I was going to say something, but it might be wrong. Uh, but I think one of the things that happened was that you only used the CMYK, right? No, I'm making that up. You mean in the graphics? That yeah, I made, like or? it was, yeah. Well, I mean, so part of the way that the book happened is um, I wanted to, I didn't want to do, I didn't want it to be um, so kind of using professional tools. So I use this like really, really like bottom of the barrel, like open source page layout program. And so then the kind of the tools that I was using kind of formed the look of the book. And yeah, so like these weird patched out colors um, worked better and they kind of started to move in. I mean, I did use a lot of CMYK, but there are some other colors. You know. And also there was a font problem, like yeah. the cheap open source stuff. Yeah, so every font has its like uh, intellectual, it's a piece of intellectual property. So, you know, when you have these commercial programs that are well established, they kind of smooth all that over. Uh, this open source problem, you know, uh, program had like a lot of trouble with the fonts because everything was kind of illegal. Like every font you would use became somehow illegal by entering into this program and then 
sending it to China became this whole other like hurdle to jump over. So yeah, Vince, illegal. Vince was unhappy. Uh, Vince was very unhappy. <laughs> uh, that's how I got to know him so well. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, I mean, communicating with China is like, yeah, it's very sort of disconnected. You know, there's like a three day lag. I feel like it's further than space somehow or something, you know, like it was definitely further than communicating to D.C., um, <laughs> which was like same time zone, same same date line. And you acted like a graphic designer for a one year period for this? Uh, it was roughly about a year. Yeah, that I was working on it. Yeah. Like one season, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there's like a season, um, a go-go season. Yeah, so I think that's a, a general introduction. I don't know. Do some questions if... <laughs> we're just kind of talking, but... <laughs> sure. Oh, if we're going to do questions, I think I'll just like, grab the mic. It's kind of, you know, we're kind of freestyle tonight. <laughs> All right, who has a question? <laughs> I have a question. Why, did you, why do you want to be the wrong guy in the wrong place? <laughs> That's kind of unusual. <laughs> well, I just feel like maybe something interesting can come out of that. I mean, everybody is trying to be like the right person at the right place. Uh, and I wanted to try that, you know. And also like this idea of something that doesn't have a container you know, usually the right thing at the right place usually has a, like an established container. So it was kind of going back to this idea of a container, something that didn't have a container. Um, yeah, sometimes the wrong thing is the right thing. Can you tell us more about the gray book and when that comes out? Um, so the gray book, um, a gray book is looking for funding. <laughs> So, but I think we may have it. So I think in early next year it's going to come out. And so basically, it's just um, so so the way it's it's thought about is um, it all started with um, this designer called Jersey Seymour, who puts this gunky stuff in all in all kind of his chairs and things, and he's made these huge pavilions made out of this gunky kind of stuff. And so at some point I was thinking, what if that gunky stuff is somehow an index? of this kind of substrate of what design is, this kind of gross swamp under it. And what if we can go there and think design again, right? What if design is maybe not either... Um, so what if design is not this kind of history of objects and the discourse around these objects? And um, I, think one of the, I think he attempts that himself because his argument is that actually design starts with Walden, right? So Thoreau is the first designer, according to him. Because design is not about objects, it's about life situations. So I, I, I didn't find that like terribly interesting, that idea. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I found the idea of, of rethinking, right? What, how, do you, how do you determine that? So I just thought this, and that coincided with the issue I did for Eflux about accelerationist aesthetics, in which uh, Francois Rocher, a French architect, kind of wrote the text, and it had this concept of the gray rolling through it. So I kind of put them together and and I, I drafted a little bit of a statement about this, you know, what if we have to rethink design again, um, right? Particularly in the face of things like something like DARPA, right? Which you can make chairs, but DARPA's making new brains or something, right? They're new, new like um, protein folds, right? They're like rethinking like organic matter at the most, at the smallest level. So um, design, right? So that's, that's, that's the kind of dark side of the moon of design, right? It's kind of mi military production and high-end capitalist production. So what if design needs to think itself in some new way in light of this? And so how do you do that? And then I was, I was also interested in how do you do that in, in kind of this kind of uh, like low-end forms, right? So you don't write the paper of how you're going to do this, right, with footnotes. You write like an, a, a Lovecraft horror story, right? You, you, don't do, you don't do like high-end theory. You do this kind of theory fiction that is slimy and gross or something. And so all that bundled together somehow is going to produce a book called The Grey, right? 
uh, yeah, but and then some people have proposed, um, you know, like I was saying, um, Leopold has done, has rethought New York. So it's a storyboard. Rethinking New York as a, a commune, like the Paris commune of 1871. Uh, Camille Lacadet, who's a, another French architect, has written this very strange, uh, almost unintelligible um, film script about Bangkok. Uh, Benjamin Bratton has written a review for an imaginary building produced by Rem Koolhaas. Um, yeah, so is this, this is the kind of format. Yeah. Is there going to be the white after you get the blackness, the, bl the gray? That's what I was about to ask. <laughs> Given that we are in the gray. It's, it's like a Jay-Z thing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and the Beatles. So. <laughs> That's right. Right. So it's right. So there's, was it the black album? Was it, was it? Danger Mouse. Remix. Right. Who did the, the gray? The, the yeah. Beatles white album. White album. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be a music producer. That's right. <laughs> I know some people. You get the graphics. <laughs> I know exactly. You get the I, graphics. I, know some people. <laughs> I have a few questions for Nick. Um, did any funny moments of dissonance arise from being in the wrong place at the right time? At, at the right time? Wrong, wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole thing was dissonant. Like there was always like friction. I mean, there was it. There was never like open hostility on either side but you know since I was doing it for free I was kind of pushing my own agenda and um, the kind of the friction that that negotiation the politics of like this is what your album should look like no no I want it to look like this you know that kind of back and forth is kind of like the glue or like the, the cartilage of the whole book I feel like so um, so yeah like all the time laughable moments or um yeah i mean it depends on your sense of humor you know <laughs> <Fair>. <laughs> what were the people like well you know i mean it's 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 pretty pretty broad uh like different people i mean you know there were all kinds of people that approached me i mean you know once you put yourself out there people start to come to you and um you know everything from like a kid in their bedroom with like big dreams to like you know like the band that's been doing the resident Saturdays every Saturday at a club you know different um, different types of people um, I think that the answer to that is mostly in the book you know um, as far as like the different types of people that I that I t talked to and worked with right so there's email like right so transcripts the, in the book and the main text of the book is like email conversations in uh, like chat room uh, and forum conversations relating to you know different subjects and so yeah you know one thing that I did a lot which really didn't go over well uh, to my like happy you know happiness was I would take like a flyer from one band and then just kind of like change the colors and then try to like have the other band take it as their flyer you know? <laughs> so, like you know these things kind of like started to add up um, and most people either didn't notice or were skeptical or just didn't like it at all, <laughs> you know, but, um, you it's hard like, to, like an imposter in the way of, yeah, well, I never, you know, I never misrepresented myself. So like, it was difficult to accuse me of being an imposter because I, I mean, I, I know how to use, you know, uh, computers to, 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 to make images. So like I was a graphic designer and I was doing it for free and I never claimed to be sort of like, you know, backed by anybody or or fake a portfolio or anything like that. So, you know, and I, and I did uh, tell the people that I was working with that, like, I'm working on a book and this is kind of part of the book. And so, like, you know, do you want your free like album cover or T-shirt design or not? You know, and it was like usually the answer was yes. Mm -hmm. um, but that was important for me, you know, to not misrepresent myself. Uh, I, I'm not interested in that, you know, if, if possible. So any any misrepresentation was accidental. <laughs> did you take the book to Washington and I did meet the send community? it. Uh, you yeah, didn't I go there personally. And, mm, and I was <laughs> never invited. <so. laughs> 
I mean, if I, w if I had been invited, I would have, you know. Um, what was the response? To the book? Indifference. I mean, like, mild interest, but mostly indifference. Like, people were interested in having me do the work, mostly, uh, and that was it. And then I saw my work get chopped up and, like, reabsorbed in places that I couldn't even imagine. You know, I would design, like, a, a square, like, CD cover, and then I'd see it on somebody else's, like, Instagram or whatever, you know, like cut in half and like, you know, some people cropped out because like they weren't in the band anymore. Like, I don't know, it just got really weird. <laughs> uh, and actually, I had a lot of back and forths where like the people that I was working with got kicked out of the band and then like, you know, I couldn't like they, the band would try to recontact me and say like, can you do it different? Because like this guy's not in the band anymore. And then that would happen like three or four times and it, it just got really uh, confusing to me. I, I didn't even know who I was working for sometimes on the project. And then sometimes I'd send them the final thing uh, and then they would, you know, like not respond. And then like three months later, um, you know, I'd, yeah, I'd see it somewhere else. And I, I thought they didn't even use it. I mean, it just, it was pretty disjointed. And you weren't curious enough to go to Washington to well, like I said, uh, you know, in the beginning, like I felt like it was like either or like if I was going to be part of the community somehow or like go and try to like be involved somehow, like I had to like decide on that from the outset. And then I decided to do it completely from the outside. And that was that was kind of the, the choice I made. Um, you know, I mean, I think if I had been invited specifically, I would have gone. But, you know, once I made that decision, it's just the way it worked out. And I thought it was important for the integrity of the project, you know, not to come after and then try to like, oh, you know, like I did this thing, like here I am at the party kind of, you know, I, d I didn't want to do that. Um, were your images copyrighted? You were talking about people using your images. Is the book or what is your take on that? Uh, I never, no, I never claimed ownership to the images that I sent back out and I, don't have a problem with it being recycled and kind of reincorporated. I mean, I did the same thing, you know, I would take images that were already existing and then kind of, you know, chop them up and reuse them. So I don't, I mean, I think it'd be great if the book was copied, you know, even. Is it copyrighted, the book? It says that in the book. No, the books are not copyrighted and the theory ones work on a Creative Commons license. So you're copyright free. So we're copyright free. I have one more question. You said you were pushing your own agenda. What was your agenda? Uh, my own visual agenda. So it's something that I guess I, I mean, I wouldn't put into words. It wasn't like a, a, <clears throat> a language based agenda. It was more of like a visual agenda. Like I was pushing the look that I wanted to push, you know, so that it and I think, the, you know, the book is not a reflection of the state of visual material in the go-go scene at all. It's more of a reflection of, like, my visual agenda that I kind of just, you know, pushed. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. <laughs> I think we're good. Okay. Um, thank you guys very much. And thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jean. Um, thank you all for coming tonight, um, and I guess we'll see everyone next week. Sounds Wave good. at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thank you, guys. Cool. Thank you. Awesome.